On this show, we compare the best parts of our childhoods and argue which decade was better, the 80s or the 90s. In this episode, we'll be discussing which decade had the better gaming system or console, the history of 1983 versus 1993, and if the 1990s McDonald's menu item, the Arch Deluxe, would fly today. Which decade was better? You can help us decide. So stick around for this episode of 10 Years Apart. We're going back, 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 way back. It's the 10 Years Apart Podcast. 80s versus 90s. With Adam and Scott, Scott, Scott. Welcome to the 10 Years Apart Podcast. I'm Scott, one of the hosts, and I'm joined by my co-host, Adam. Adam, how's things going? Things are going good, thanks. So this podcast is all about comparing our childhoods. My childhood was growing up during the 80s and Adam during the 90s, making us 10 years apart. In this episode, we are going to be comparing which decade we thought had the best gaming system as a child. I'll pick my favorite gaming system from the 1980s and Adam will pick his from the 1990s. Then we'll debate on which gaming system was the best. And remember, you can also vote which gaming system was your favorite from those decades. You can vote right here if you're watching us on YouTube by clicking on the poll in the top right corner. Or you can vote on any of our social media at 10 Years Apart Pod or by visiting our website at 10YearsApart.com. After we get through our debate on the best gaming system, we'll also have our segment which we call Does It Fly Today? where we look at a movie, song, or a product from either the 1980s or 1990s and discuss why we think it faded away and if we think it would hold up today. On this episode, we'll be looking back at the 1990s McDonald's item, the Arch Deluxe, and asking, would that fly today? That will be a little later, so stick around for that, too. And before we get into our best gaming console debate, we're going to start off with the first segment, which we call A Year From Our Past. A Year From Our Past. In A Year From Our Past, we'll be doing a brief history look back at a year from each decade and what we remember from those years. So Scott will be looking back at 1983, and I'll be covering 1993. So I'll be getting it started with movies from 1983. Some popular movies that came out in this year were Flashdance, War Games, Sudden Impact, Staying Alive, Risky Business, Terms of Endurment, Training Places, A Christmas Story, Crawl, Sleepaway Camp, and of course, Return of the Jedi. The best picture from 1983 was Terms of Endearment. The highest grossing movie from 1983 was Return of the Jedi with $375 million worldwide. Some popular movies released in 1993 were Mrs. Doubtfire, The Firm, Cliffhanger, Philadelphia, The Fugitive, Sleepless in Seattle, Indecent Proposal, Schindler's List, and Jurassic Park. The movie that took away the Best Picture Oscar was Schindler's List, and the highest grossing film of 1993 was Jurassic Park, with an almost $915 million gross worldwide. Wow, that was a, that was a big year for Steven Spielberg. It was, indeed. With Schindler's List and Jurassic Park. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know what Schindler's List made at the box office, but definitely a great movie. Wasn't a movie that I could, you know, rewatch often, but it was a a movie that I did watch that year, and one maybe one of my favorite Spielberg movies. Yeah, I think it's really well done. Jurassic Park was a a great, you know, theater experience. It was a movie I really enjoyed too. Some of those other movies from the '90s, I mean, Stallone and Cliffhanger, Miss Doubtfire was Miss Doubtfire. That's Robin Williams. He dresses up as oh, a yeah, nanny yeah, yeah. to try and get back into his ex-wife's house. Oh, I, th- I thought that was earlier than the 90s. But some of the movies in 1983 I did enjoy and saw that year. A couple of them most people might not have heard of. Crawl was a, kind of a sci-fi movie that I really liked that I actually saw that year. War Games, I think I saw that year. Other movies, Flashdance, Sudden Impact... Uh, Staying Alive. Staying Alive is the sequel to Saturday Night Fever? I think so, yeah. Yeah. With uh, John Travolta. Yeah. 
A Christmas Story. I put that on there because it's uh, actually one of my favorite Christmas movies to watch that I kind of watch almost every Christmas. And a lot of the other movies I saw when I was a little older, like Sleepaway Camp had an ending that absolutely terrified me. Oh, yeah. Same here. I don't think the movie was that good and didn't really scare me, but the ending when she's standing there and she's a guy with a yeah you know big dong hanging out. Yeah, I remember Sleepaway Camp. I saw it as a kid, and I was terrified of Angela, who's the uh, the central character. And I remember my siblings actually teasing me and be like, "Angela's coming to get you," and I'd be I would lose it, like I would start crying and shit, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I could see why. <laughs> But Return of the Jedi, I definitely saw in the theater, and you know it was a good ending to a trilogy, and it was kind of sad because I kind of thought, you know, there wasn't going to be any more Star Wars movies. Mm -hmm. Maybe there shouldn't have been. Who knows? But Mm. definitely uh, a a great third movie to a great trilogy. Yeah, for me, uh, the only film that really sticks out is Sleepaway Camp. And also Return of the Jedi, obviously. That was my favorite one as a kid because it had Jabba the Hutt and all those other interesting characters. You get to see Darth Vader's face. Uh, Risky Business, I think I saw later on with Tom Cruise and Rebecca De Mornay. And for the 1990s movies, uh, Mrs. Doubtfire was one of my favorites. I quite liked Cliffhanger. Um, The Fugitive, I think I saw in theater with my dad and I thought it was pretty entertaining. Uh, for Schindler's List, as I said, is one of my favorite Spielberg movies I mentioned in a previous episode. And Jurassic Park was huge for me as a kid. Uh, they had all the merchandise as well. Being, you know, you had the Dino Fries and McDonald's and all these other uh, toys that came along with it. So yeah, I think I'm more familiar with the '90s movies, but you know, those some of those in the in the '80s, I I could still watch today. <laughs> All right, in 1983, hit music. Some hit songs from that year were Billie Jean and Beat It from Michael Jackson. Total Eclipse of the Heart by Bonnie Tyler. Come On Aline by the Dexie Midnight Runners. Do You Really Want to Hurt Me by The Culture Club. Africa from Toto. 1999 from Prince. And Down Under by Men at Work. The Song of the Year from the Billboard's Top 100 and the Grammy for the Song of the Year was Every Breath You Take by The Police. And some hit music from 1993 was Runaway Train by Soul Asylum, I'm Gonna Be 500 Miles by The Proclaimers, What's Up by Four Non Blondes, Whoop There It Is by Tag Team, Two Princes by The Spin Doctors, Rhythm is a Dancer by Snap, and the theme from Cops Bad Boys by Inner Circle. Song of the Year on the Billboard Top 100 was I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston. And the song that took away the Grammy for the best song is A Whole New World from Aladdin. Uh, A lot of the 90s music I didn't care for that much. The only two on that list that I kind of liked was What's Up by Four Non Blondes and uh, I'm Gonna Be by The Proclaimers. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm sure there are a lot of other songs that are not on this list that I kind of liked, but as far as the 80s goes, I mean, Billie Jean and Beat It by Michael Jackson, when that came out, I mean, that's when Michael Jackson started to become the superstar that he was. Uh, Total Eclipse of the Heart is a classic song. Come on, Arlene, another classic. Culture Club were big. I wasn't a huge fan of theirs. Africa is a pretty, uh, I would say it's a great song. Mm-hmm. And Men at Work were a band that I was really into. I think an Australia band, obviously. And Every Breath You Take is uh, quite a good song. Yeah, some of that 80s music uh, I can remember quite well. Um, yeah, I like a lot of the 80s songs. The Come On Eileen by Dexie's Midnight Runners, my friend's mother is actually in that music video. She's pushing one of her one of her oldest sons, who was a baby at the time, she's pushing him in a stroller, or as they say in England, a pram. Uh, Yeah, those 80s songs are pretty classic. From the 90s, I remember liking Runaway Train quite a bit. And of course, I'm Gonna Be, the Proclaimer song was popularized by the movie Benny and June with Johnny Depp. Uh, Yeah, some of the 90s songs I like quite a bit. Obviously, Bad Boys, the theme from Cops is huge. And I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston from The Bodyguard. Yeah, I'm not a huge Whitney Houston fan, but that song was actually pretty powerful. Yeah. She has a great voice. In, in the movie, it was. Yeah, yeah. She has I think that was, it's actually a Dolly Parton song. Oh, written, oh yeah, written that's by right. Dolly Parton. That's right. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, she did a great job with it, I guess. 
And in 1983's TV news and other events in TV, we had Fraggle Rock first airing on HBO, and it's actually one of HBO's first original shows ever created. And the final episode of MASH aired with a record audience of 125 million watching. Some popular toys that came out in 1983, we had Cabbage Patch Dolls. And Mario Bros. game debuted for Nintendo. I believe just in Japan, though. Some technical breakthroughs in 1983. Microsoft Word is first released. Didn't even realize it was that old. The U.S. Space Shuttle Challenger is launched. Uh, The Swatch is introduced. And the first mobile phones were made by Motorola. Some news and events from 1983. Margaret Thatcher became the Prime Minister in the UK. The United States invade Granada. A 5.2 earthquake hits central New York. And Sally Ride on June 18th becomes the first American woman in space on the Space Shuttle Challenger. Some notable TV moments from 1993 include Beavis and Butthead premiering on MTV and Saved by the Bell broadcasts its series finale on NBC as the cast graduates. And in 1993, the first Got Milk commercial is broadcast on TV, and the TV Food Network makes its debut. A popular toy release from this year are Beanie Babies. Some technical breakthroughs from 1993 include the Pentium microprocessor introduced by Intel, Windows NT 3.1 is released by Microsoft, And with the release of Jurassic Park, we see the pioneering use of computer-generated imagery to produce moving images of prehistoric creatures. And also, ID Software's Doom is released, becoming a landmark title in the first-person shooter video games. Some news events from 1993 include the first female prime minister in Canada, Kim Campbell, and also the first World Trade Center bombing. We also have the Waco siege, beginning in Texas. And finally, we have child sexual abuse accusations against Michael Jackson. So the 90s news, I remember when Kim, was it Kim Campbell? Kim Campbell. I remember when Kim Campbell became the first female prime minister. I think I was in university. Quite short-lived though, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it it lasted a year. And I remember the first World Trade Center bombing. The Waco thing was always on the news. The Michael Jackson stuff, I don't remember hearing much about it at that time. I heard about it, you know, maybe later on. Mm -hmm. Doom, I remember really liking that game, actually, and playing that against friends online. Yeah, I love Doom. And then later on came Quake. Yeah, Quake was uh, the one that I really liked, but I think Doom started it all. Yeah. It's also kind of weird. In 1983, we had the Cabbage Patch dolls, which were huge. It was so popular. Right. And in demand and sold out and expensive. Then in 93, you had the same thing with Beanie Babies. Yeah, and going on for the Beanie Babies things, did you ever see the picture of the couple that were getting divorced and in court it had a huge pile of Beanie Babies and they were sorting through, you know, who could keep which ones? Uh, I don't know if I saw that. I yeah, might it's have. kind of a famous image on the internet now. But uh, yeah, I remember Beanie Babies quite well. I never collected them or anything. I thought they were kind of silly. Uh, Beavis and Butthead was huge for young kids at the time, young boys. Uh, Say by the Bell was one of those after-school specials that I tuned into regularly. And I remember the first Got Milk ads as well on TV. Uh, for the 1980s, the only thing that sticks out for me really is uh, Microsoft Word. It's because, you know, it's kind of ubiquitous in any office or any kind of workplace yeah, nowadays. we're using it now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and just in terms of the 90s news events, I mean, obviously the first World Trade Center bombing won't be remembered as much as the, the, the follow-up in 2001. Yeah, there's a movie, I don't know if it came out, it might have came out in the 90s or the early 2000s that I really liked, that it's not a true story or based off this event, but it reminds me of that event. It Mm. was called Arlington Road with Tim Robbins. Oh, I think I've heard of that, yeah. uh, It was a really, really good movie, or at least the whole, the the ending of it, I'm not going to give it away, but it's worth watching. Mm. Yeah, and just the Waco Siege. I mean, I saw that miniseries that came out with that Canadian actor, Taylor Kish, who plays, uh, who's the guy in Waco? Uh, David Koresh. Yeah, David maybe. Koresh. He plays him. I think they have one of the Culkin brothers in that series as well. He's kind of like a side character. But yeah, it was really well done. Um, just showed how like miscommunication between everyone just kind of led to utter disaster there. 
And the Michael Jackson thing, I didn't learn until until later on when you know things like South Park would uh, depict him as being this this total weirdo who had a fascination with kids and stuff. Of course, there's a lot more music, movies, and events from both 1983 and 1993. So feel free to let us know about your favorites and your memories from these specific years in the comments below, wherever you find this podcast. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you regarding these years and get your feedback. Now let's move on to the main topic of this episode. It's time for Battle of the Decade. Three, two, one. Battle of the Decade. Fight. I must break you. So for the Battle of the Decade in this episode, and our main topic, we'll be fighting it out on which decade had the best gaming system as a child. Round one. Let's fight. Choose your fighter. So from the 1980s, some honorable mentions that I have for the best gaming console. I have the Sega Genesis, the 16-bit version, which came out in 1989. I remember this most for the NHL game. Uh, The Intellivision, which came out in 1980, is probably one of the first ones that I ever saw or remember. A friend of mine had it, and we always played Asteroids and a a downhill skiing game on it. The Commodore 64, which came out in 1982, and the VIC-20 came out a year before that, which I had. But the Commodore 64 played games on a floppy disk, and it had great games like G.I. Joe, Summer, Winter, Olympics, and Tapper. It was really fun to play. And of course, probably the most popular one, and the one people think I'm going to choose, was the Nintendo Entertainment System, which came out in 1985. It was the most famous and the only one to have survived into the 90s. And, you know, you might remember that from the Orange Gun, and Duck Hunt, and Mario Bros, and Excite Bike were some of the games that came with it. But despite that, my choice for the best 1980s gaming console was ColecoVision by Coleco, which came out in 1982. And for gaming consoles from the 1990s, some honorable mentions I will include are Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, the 32-bit version, which came later, and N64, which had games like GoldenEye and Mario Kart. But my choice for the best gaming console of the 1990s is the Sony PlayStation. Produced by Sony Interactive Entertainment. Round two. Let's fight. Tell the tape. So some of the reasons why I picked ColecoVision from the 80s was it was the first gaming console to have arcade quality graphics. So was, the games are almost just like the, sta- the old stand-up arcade games you would see in an arcade. This console made Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. famous. It had different controllers that you could get, like the joystick version with the numeric keypad, the roller controller, the driving controller, and the super action controller. It had some of my favorite games during that decade that I like to play, like Zaxxon, Smurf Rescue, Cubert, Star Wars, the Donkey Kong games, and Super Action Baseball. And you could also play Atari 2600 games on it with their cartridges, which uh, a lot of people didn't even know. And the driving control and the driving games took things to an all-new level for home gaming. As a kid, it was one of the first times I remember ever feeling what it would be like, like driving a car. So it had like the whole steering wheel type thing and a little shifter and also the uh, foot pedals. So those are some of the reasons why I picked ColecoVision. And my choice for the best gaming console from the 1990s was the Sony PlayStation, which, as I mentioned, was produced by Sony Interactive Entertainment, a division of Sony, with the first console being released as the PlayStation in Japan in 1994 and worldwide the following year. Some breakthrough games included Metal Gear Solid, Resident Evil 2, Crash Bandicoot, Tekken 3, Tomb Raider 2, and my personal favorite, Twisted Metal 2, a game in which different cars equipped with weapons would battle to the death in various arenas. One of the reasons I chose the Sony PlayStation is because the original digital controller, which was then replaced by the dual analog in 1997, and this added two analog sticks based on the same potentiometer technology as the analog joystick. This controller was also then succeeded by the DualShock controller, which had the controller shaking at times during gameplay. 
Uh, I think the Sony PlayStation obviously paved the way for today's top consoles. And even though the graphics are laughed at now for being boxy and unrealistic, they were impressive for that time. The original PlayStation games walked so that these amazing newer games like Spider-Man and Red Dead Redemption 2 could run. Those are the reasons why I chose the Sony PlayStation. Round 3. Let's fight. Counterattack. So I don't remember playing the PlayStation that much when it came out. Was the PlayStation like CDs or yeah, discs. CDs? Yeah. Discs. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, or I hoped with the technology like 12 years after ColecoVision that the graphics and the game selection would be way better. But as a child, ColecoVision was a game changer for me. And I have some of the fondest memories playing it at a friend's house because I didn't have one. So going to my friend's house and getting to play baseball was, was a big thing for me. I mean, I always look forward to visiting my friends due to the ColecoVision. When it came out, it was around $175 when it was released. The PlayStation was around $299, so it's probably not that much difference. It's probably about $10 difference with inflation. But back then, you know, that was a lot of money for a gaming console. If you had a ColecoVision in 1982, it was something special, and it put, you know, that person on the map. It had so much more meaning, and we would relish every minute we got to play it. Game consoles like PlayStation and other ones after it, they became kind of so commonplace and, you know, mainstream, and you could find them in almost every home, making it less special. And it was more of a waste of time than quality time spent. And my opinion of ColecoVision is that it sounds like it's fun for retro game playing, but I think the PlayStation games would be more enjoyable due to their problem-solving and advanced role-playing status. Uh, games like Metal Gear Solid and Siphon Filter had you kind of like... Uh, sneaking around and picking up on radar, trying not to get caught by these guards who are hunting you down. I thought the racing games like Need for Speed were a lot of fun. And overall, I think the graphics were simply much better. So that's why I think that PlayStation is superior. Yeah, more complicated. More complicated. Which is not a good thing. Sometimes, uh, you know, with having so many different games and complicated games to play, you waste a lot of time, you know, That's put, right. putting this game in. Eh, let's play, try this, let's try this. Okay. Yeah, I, I can see that. Round four. Let's fight. Final round. So finally, the reason why I think ColecoVision is the best gaming console of both decades. I had the fondest memories playing this console out of all of them. Even the ones that had better graphics and the better consoles that came later, ColecoVision just has, you know, strong memories for me. The funnest times I had spent with an old friend of mine and getting to play the game with him at his house was a big, you know, a big thing for my memory. Maybe because I didn't have one and, you know, we couldn't afford it at that time, it made the time I got to play it more special. It was quality time for me, more than wasted time that you get with the modern, commonplace gaming consoles of today. It really brought the arcade home for the first time in history. It made games like Donkey Kong and Cuber famous. And again, just like going to the arcade, it was an event where, you know, whenever you got to play ColecoVision. And that's why I chose the ColecoVision from Coleco Gaming System. And some final thoughts on my choice. I think that Sony PlayStation offered better graphics, obviously, and I think that the game selection for PlayStation was wide, catered to children, young adults, and adults. I thought the analog controllers brought the joystick back into the game playing experience, which was good. And also those uh, dual shock controllers I thought were pretty uh, groundbreaking for their time. You know, you have a character in the game who gets shot at or gets uh, hit with something, and you get the the controller vibrating, which I thought was really cool when it first came out. And I think that the, the wide variety of PlayStation games was astonishing. Uh, I think even to this day, I have a PlayStation 4 at home, and some of the games I play I could waste days on, not just hours, if I didn't have a job. Yes, waste. <laughs> but those are the reasons why I chose PlayStation as the best gaming system. So which gaming system do you think was better from which decade? Was it the ColecoVision from the 80s or was it Sony PlayStation from the 90s? Remember, you can vote on which of these gaming systems you thought was better in the poll in the above top right corner here on YouTube 
or on any of our social media at 10 Years Apart Pod or at our website, 10yearsapart.com. And finally, on this episode of 10 Years Apart, we're going to look back at the 1990s McDonald's menu item that was known as the Arch Deluxe. Could it make a comeback? Why did it fade away? It's time for Would That Fly Today. Would That Fly Today? The Arch Deluxe was a hamburger from McDonald's that was put on their menu in 1996, and it was geared towards adults more in the advertising. It didn't last for more than a year and was gone by 1997. Adam, do you remember the Arch Deluxe from McDonald's? Yeah, I remember this burger. I remember liking it quite a bit. I remember the sauce was kind of something unique. Uh, It didn't taste like anything else on the McDonald's menu. So yeah, I was actually quite sad when they got rid of it. I think uh, if it sold more, it probably would have stayed on. But uh, if they reintroduced it as kind of like a limited series kind of burger, I'd probably go to McDonald's to eat it. Yeah, this was a, a, a hamburger I really enjoyed. Uh, I was older, and it was geared towards adults, I guess, so I kind of enjoyed that. But uh, I could drive at that time, and you know, I began frequenting places like McDonald's more often using the drive throughs because I had a car. And I loved the taste of the burger, and it literally got me to visit McDonald's even more. So why do you think the Arch Deluxe faded away? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I think it probably just didn't sell well enough, enough for it to be on the fixed menu at McDonald's, which is kind of a shame. Uh, as I said, it's pretty tasty. I think we can both agree that it was, a, it was a good burger. Yeah, the same thing for me. I mean, I think it disappeared for the same reason you mentioned. It just didn't sell enough to keep it. I think McDonald's has a thing for their menu items that if it doesn't sell like a billion items in a certain time period, it uh, gets taken off the menu. So yeah, obviously it didn't sell well enough in North America for it to stay on the menu. And do you think the Arch Deluxe could fly today? I don't know if it could fly today, but if they reintroduced it, I'd get one, even if it was like a limited time offer kind of thing. Like I said, it tastes different. It was very unique to the McDonald's menu. So even if they reintroduce or if they introduced something that was similar in its taste, yeah, it might it might go over well. How about you, Scott? Do you think it could fly today? Uh, I think it could, and I think people would love it. Not sure on the name. Like, I don't know if you change the name, it would help it or not. Uh, I don't even know, like, is the Arch Deluxe, like, from the, you know, named after the McDonald's arches, or is it because the bun was bigger and shaped more like a arch on the actual hamburger itself? Maybe it's both, who knows, but, uh, if it was brought back, as of someone who maybe goes to McDonald's, like, once a year now, maybe not even that much, I probably would bring me back to McDonald's to try it again. And uh, bring back some of those memories of uh, being in the university and hitting the drive throughs in my car on the way home. Also, give us your feedback on the McDonald's Arch Deluxe in the comments below. You can also share with us your memories of eating this hamburger on our social media at 10 Years Apart Pod or at our website, 10yearsapart.com. The McDonald's 1990s Arch Deluxe Hamburger. Would it fly today? Yes. Maybe. Well, that's it for this episode of 10 Years Apart. Thanks for listening, and you can now help us out by helping us decide which decade had the best gaming console. Just head over to our website at 10 Years Apart or any of our social media at 10 Years Apart Pod and vote right now. Leave us your comments and thoughts below wherever you find this podcast. Join us again next week when we talk about which decade had the best horror movie. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or anywhere you find podcasts so you never miss an episode. If you came across this episode and enjoyed it, please hit that like button. Subscribe to us here on YouTube for the latest videos and don't forget to share. Sharing really helps us out. And once again, find us at 10yearsapart.com or any social media at 10 Years Apart Pod. Stop by, vote, and let us know some of your stories from the 80s or the 90s. Remember to like, subscribe, share, and leave us your comments wherever you found this podcast. And thanks again for tuning into the past with us here on 10 Years Apart. What did you think about that episode of the 10 Years Apart podcast? If you liked it, don't forget to hit that thumbs up button below. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos like this. 
Vote on which decade you thought was better for this episode in the top right corner or at 10yearsapart.com. And leave us any comments you may have regarding the 1980s or the 1990s. Thanks again, and you can also check out some more videos like these. Thanks.